welcome all of you. All, welcome to all the distinguished speakers for this theological reflection, for this faith discussion on inequality at this festival of inequality to discuss, to address, and most important, to transform, to overcome inequality. I'm Eleni Neuenfeld. I'm the um, gender justice manager in the working at ACT Alliance in the office in Geneva. And I'm honored to be moderating this panel, this theological conversation, this discussion. Uh, we are going to have two sessions, two parts in this uh, webinar. One is uh, two theological reflections, one from a Muslim perspective, another one from a Christian perspective, addressing issues of inequality and how faith can play a role to overcome inequality. And then the second part of the webinar, we are addressing issues from a different uh, thematic perspective or different nuances of overcoming inequality from a faith perspective. Um, we are going to have a short reflection uh, uh, from um, my own experience of uh, being a theologian, working on gender justice. Um, I would like to motivate, to inspire our reflection today um, from, a, from a, a word that is uniting us in this fight of inequality. The word is a theological word. The word is a prophetical word. It's justice. We are working, we are committed for justice in, in different realms, in different spheres, in different fields. Our own work on gender justice is addressing issues of inequality among women and men or different uh, people of different genders. And this work has to do with promoting dignity, with believing that all human beings are created in God's image, and with the perspective that we are addressing issues of power relationship, power to, to promote uh, power balance and to uh, work that there is an uh, to work on the elimination of systems that are promoting oppression. And this is the basic understanding of gender justice. And with this perspective of justice, which is uniting us as uh, a world that is creating our network in addressing inequality, I would like to invite our two first panelists. And I, I would like to give the word to Sheikh Yusuf, um, Yusuf Ayami from the Family Development uh, Initiative in Zambia. And uh, Sheikh Yusuf will address how from a perspective, from a Muslim perspective, uh, people of faith should be involved to transform inequality. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf, you have five, seven minutes to give your, your perspective, your reflection. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Madam Moderator, uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, address this uh, meeting. I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, the efforts of the um, organizers in uh, organizing um, this very um, uh, timely meeting or um, uh, you know, gathering where we are going to talk about issues of uh, inequality. And uh, I'm glad that you have given me an opportunity to share from an Islamic perspective uh, issues of equality, fighting uh, inequality and uh, injustice. Uh, equality and the fight against inequality has been at the center stage of divine message to mankind. One of the main objectives of all the messengers sent to guide, my, to guide mankind from Nuh, alayhi salam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus to Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon them all, 
was to remove people from being slaves of fellow human beings to being servants of the only one and true master God. In essence, the message was that all human beings are equal. This message is consistent with the objective for which God created us all, to be vicegerents of God on earth. And remember, when your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to place a vicegerent on earth. Fulfilling the role of vicegerency requires, among other things, freedom from any form of bondage, so that one is free to exercise his or her will and in the process, innovate and create. The Bhav is reflected in the message that was sent by the second Khalifa or successor to the Prophet Umar ibn al-Khattab to Amr ibn al-As, who was the ruler of Egypt when news reached Umar ibn al-Khattab that one of ibn al-As's children had abused an ordinary Egyptian citizen. Omar sent Ibn al-As the following message. When did you start enslaving people when their mothers birthed them in a state of freedom? This statement encapsulates what the message of Islam is and has always been that society should be just and equal. Equality has many dimensions, among which economic equality or the elimination of poverty and ensuring wealth and prosperity for all citizens is but one of them. Islam considers the prosperity of all citizens a key cornerstone for proper belief. In one of the hadith or prophetic sayings, the prophet is narrated to have said, Kaad al fakru an yakuna kufran. Poverty has the potential of leading one to disbelief. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, one of the companions of the Prophet and the fourth successor to the Prophet is quoted to have said, had poverty been a man, I would have killed it with my own hands. In fact, on more than one occasion, the Prophet besieged God to protect him from poverty. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-fakr. Oh God, I seek your refuge from poverty. The question that begs is, why should we fight poverty and inequality? Why does Islam abhor poverty? And why should we seek for God's protection from poverty and deprivation? Why should society as a collective deliberately work towards addressing poverty? Well, we have to do that because the consequences of poverty are grave. Poverty creates deprivation and deprived people are potential hotspots for danger. If I digress, Bob Marley once said, a hungry man is an angry man. Poverty and in economic inequality have the potential to cause a lot of instability, leading to upheaval and conflict. Indeed, when you scan the world and look at conflict spots today, you will realize that these hotspots are found in those areas that are experiencing high levels of poverty and inequality. But again, as previously mentioned, Poverty has the potential to drive people to disbelief. What then does Islam say, or what is the Islamic pres prescription in addressing poverty? Well, in addressing poverty, Islam has anchored its guidance on three pillars. These are the first pillar. Islam calls us to create an environment where people are allowed to transact freely amongst themselves without any let or hindrance. In other words, Islam requires or requests that market forces and the effects of supply and demand regulate transactions. To this effect, Islamic teachings say, that let people transact freely and let God provide sustenance to other people through the transactions that happen within them. It is when people are left to freely transact that innovation and creativity is born because people are rewarded according to what they are able to offer. This also naturally promotes hard work which potentially grows production. In the second pillar, Islam has called for us to promote the system of zakat. Now Islam understands that when people are left to innovate and create and to be hardworking, there is going to be wealth that is going to be created. But however, it also understands that this can create cartels and monopolies. In order to curb greed and promote empathy, zakat then is introduced 
which requires that those that are wealthy in society should put aside 2.5% of their annual wealth to provide to a public treasury or vital mile that is going to be used as a public fund to guarantee basic necessities that people need, including food, water, shelter, and clothing, but also to promote the ascension of people to the social ladder. And then finally, the third pillar, Islam calls for the creation of an environment where work and production is rewarded and speculation, gambling, and corruption is prohibited. The prophet is said, Man ghashana falaysa minna, he who defrauds us is not one of us. La'ana rasulullah rashi wal murtashi, the prophet cursed the briber and the one that is bribed. In conclusion, there is no justification for the squalor and poverty that most parts of the world are experiencing today. This situation has come about because we have abandoned divine guidance and adopted systems that are self-centered and promote greed. In order for us to address this again, we need to promote the liberalization of our economy so that innovation, creativity, and the principles of demand and supply control the economy. But secondly, we need to make it compulsory for the wealth and the privileged in society to contribute to a public social fund that allows for basic necessities to be provided, but also pushes people up the social ladder so that they in turn can qualify to be able to pay zakat. And finally, we need to create an environment that rewards hard work and punishes speculation and corruption. As I end, I ask God and seek from him refuge from poverty and squalor. We also seek from God refuge from grief and sadness, from weakness and laziness, from miseryness and from cowardice, from being overcome by debt and overpowered by men. Aqulu kawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-muslimina min kulli dham fa astaghfiruhu tuba lil-mustaghfirin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your inspiring words, Sheikh Yusuf Ayami from Zambia. Um, it was a very provocative, very deep reflection. Thank you so much. We are uh, continuing our theological reflection. Uh, if uh, Father Florence uh, Riwembiza from Tanzania is in the room, we invite Father Florence. If not, he's not in the room. So we continue our conversation. Uh, thank you again. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf for giving us this foundation of faith to continue our conversation, uh, to continue our reflection. Now we are going to a more uh, concrete perspective in terms of our diaconal practices that we are um, having in different faith-based organizations with an interfaith perspective. And the first one is coming from Indonesia. The first experience will come from Indonesia. Arshinta Suemarsono is the director of the Community Development and Humanitarian of Yakum. And uh, Arshinta will have five minutes to reflect on the COVID pandemic and uh, the vaccine inequality. So how we are, how we are fighting, fighting inequality from our perspective in uh, Indonesia. Uh, Elaine, thank you. Can I start now? You see the presentation? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, thank you for opportunities given to us to share our context. Uh, let's have a quick reality check. I hope it works. Sorry if it's uh, it doesn't run very fast, but you see that the number of transgender in Indonesia is quite high and it's increasing over time. And we observed that 60% of transgender reported experiencing verbal violence, which caused psychosocial burden and stigma. And this negative stigma uh, actually lead uh, them to a situation where their access to basic rights is uh, limited, uh, including education. And it, in turn affected their access to regular livelihood. 
75% of transgender in Indonesia uh, only do uh, informal jobs, 75% uh, of them uh, working at salon, uh, in street workers, in, including sex workers, and it leads them to a situation where they are more risk, uh, have a exposed to higher risk of uh, sexual transmitted diseases, including HIV AIDS. And, uh, but we are quite unfortunate, uh, quite fortunate because access to a ARV services in Yogyakarta or Indonesia in general is uh, quite good because government installed already safe and free uh, access in some uh, hospital across the country. But unfortunately, many uh, transgender people leave homes in young age due to families rejections, due to stigmas. And it creates a situation that 60% of them lost their access to ID cards at home. And this is quite bad because after COVID, access to a vaccine requires ID numbers and 60% uh, of them do not have it. And uh, access to our every services for those which HIV positive is interrupted due to uh, uh, severe uh, supply from other countries especially from India, and uh, access to tests also uh, decrease because many uh, VCT uh, mobile uh, services also stops, and access to regular healthcare services also very minimal. Many primary healthcare and hospitals are focused on uh, uh, COVID treatment and decrease access to free condom also observed because many of these uh, program for uh, sexual transmitted disease prevention is also decreased. And uh, last July, we got a report that 11 transgender people died, not because of COVID, but because of prolonged distress and sick because, uh, sick because they lost their uh, daily income. What we do, Yakum as the biggest uh, Christian health organization in Indonesia has been working for uh, transgender uh, disability persons and elderly people for quite some years. And with this regard of the situation, we advocate uh, government to uh, ease the ID requirements so that many, uh, so that transgender can have uh, access to vaccine. We also uh, talk with the government to have the, uh, better data management so that we can see many uh, transgender do not uh, get vaccinated and then uh, can get vaccine because the data then is uh, uh, more proper. We also uh, directly uh, discuss with the provider of uh, uh, what we call shelter because uh, hospital is quite overload and uh, the mild cases supposed to be uh, treated in the shelter and with uh, some discussions uh, involving the transgender people those shelter can be accessed uh, by them and as well as the uh, accessibility of those uh, shelter uh, so that people with disability can access it. And also we talk with the vaccinators, with the health offices that uh, uh, the requirements of uh, having uh, a vaccine can be eaten. So uh, we do not need the CD4 card, but also using only the uh, fit, uh, was it the physical observations as, and as long as they get access to medicine, they can get access to vaccine. And besides that, we also uh, provide uh, immediate health, uh, support in form of vitamin, nutrition, as, as many other organizations do, and also provide trainings uh, so that uh, they can maintain their, uh, their own health at home, uh, doing the breathing techniques, uh, vegetable planting, herbal soap uh, productions, etc. cetera. Uh, support their role as fundraiser and advocate and active organizer themselves so that they can manage the public donation themselves. They are able to support hundreds of other transgender with food and vitamin and in doing so uh, they are visible i mean they are not only the target of our, our assistance but they are visible in coordination structure and in uh, our human system and be the active uh, uh, actors and this is only the uh, one of the testimony when the first vaccine for transgender uh, people in Yogyakarta where we are working is uh, uh, taking place uh, yes, by doing that, we as member of Egg Alliance uh, in Indonesia, founded by two big synods in Java, confirmed that our commitment to inclusive health services continued, and uh, we are glad that we are able to share uh, our experience in this uh, occasion. Thank you. Back to you, Elaine. Thank you very much, Ashinta. Thank you very much for sharing very concrete examples, very concrete work that you are doing in Indonesia. I just want to remind 
our the organizers of this panel of this whole event is the World Council of Churches, ACT Alliance, Lutheran World Federation, Christian Aid, Norwegian Church Aid. So I'm making sure that all of the organizers are included in this uh, in this panel in this uh, recognizing in this event. We are going now to have a short video coming from uh, Bishop Ingeborg Mittom from uh, the Church of Norway. And she will also address us in the topic of the pandemic and how to overcome from a faith perspective the inequalities. Uh, the video. Dear people of faith, dear sisters and brothers, it's a great honor for me to be able to greet you today, although I feel ashamed. The West have more vaccines than we ever will need, enough doses to vaccinate each of our citizens several times over. I feel ashamed because I know healthcare workers in many countries around the world still not have got their vaccine. From an ethical point of view, the shortage of doses for the world's poorest people is catastrophic moral failure. Africa has received the fewest vaccine in the globe so far. Of the 3.5 million people already vaccinated worldwide, only 1.6% are in African countries. And new cases have been on the continent, leading to a fresh wave of lockdowns, overwhelmed healthcare systems, lost livelihoods, and worst of all, a large death toll. Many of these could have been prevented if more Africans were vaccinated. Global health authorities have warned that during a global pandemic, Nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Yet, vaccine inequality means that new virus strains could emerge and spread quickly to the rest of the world. That's not their responsibility. The responsibility belongs to us. As people of faith, we have to remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I learned it from the Bible, but I know it is found in most religions and cultures. And first time I visited the UN building in New York, I saw it on the wall there, and it gave me hope for the future. Look into the face of another, and what do you see? A fellow human being, with the same dreams and hopes for a future. And more important, with the right to dream and hope for a future. And that's why it was heartbreaking to read. The biggest lesson for Africa, some leaders say, is that it is on its own. And there is no such thing as global solidarity when people are at their most vulnerable. As a continent, we must stop believing that there's anybody out there who is a biblical Good Samaritan who's just about to come and help us, Kenya's health minister said in May. The situation has not been better since May. This is a situation where we've seen very clearly that it's everyone for himself or for herself and God for us all. I started to greet you as people of faith. Together we are strong and we can strengthen the voice to the voiceless. We will continue to address vaccine inequality. We will work for global COVID-19 recovery and bring hope. Together we have to remember the word of Mahatma Gandhi. The world has enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. And that's true also when it comes to the vaccines. It is true 
that we are in this together. Let's work together for global solidarity. Thank you. Thank you for the words of our bishop. Uh, we continue with our conversation, with our reflections now, bringing an experience, a reflection coming from Malaysia. We are listening now from Mr. Adi Setia, who is working at the Research Center for Islamic Leg Legislations and Ethics. Uh, Adia, the word is yours. Hey, thank you. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, first, of all, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, the organizer for for, uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, global webinar on uh, on confronting inequality. Uh, I was asked to uh, talk uh, to give my thought on the question of debt. So uh, I shall read from a short paper that I've uh, quickly uh, drafted for this occasion. Uh, in the Islamic tradition, uh, justice is rooted in the restoration of balance and the redress of disparities and unfair advantage. In, uh, in operational terms, uh, just justice at the minimum means to do no harm so the least amount of justice is to do no harm and a higher degree of justice is to desire for uh, for others the good that you desire for uh, 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 the good that we desire for ourselves and this ethics of the golden rule applies to all social economic uh, transactions between Muslims themselves and also between Muslims and non-Muslims. Thus, uh, okay, Islamic uh, law and ethics encourages fair trade, but denounces uh, interest or, uh, or usury, uh, both uh, in uh, uh, in financial loans and in commercial uh, obligation, right? So uh, Islam advocates the giving up of all ill cotton gain uh, of of ill uh, of all ill cotton wealth uh, gained through uh, uh, to interest or usury and 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 other forms of. Uh, or what or covert issues practices, including uh, unfair trade treaties and lopsided business deals, or the imposition of arbitrary charges or fees uh, with no reciprocal counter values. So, in more general terms, uh, riba or usury encompasses all ill gotten gains through unfair commercial. Of financial transactions. So, given the uh, okay, given the above uh, ethical moral precepts, when it comes to the issue of debt uh, in uh, uh, in economic terms, the following ethical legal principles apply in practice. A monetary loan, for example, a cash loan offered to someone in need uh, is always considered a charitable act. And hence, the creditor is not allowed to, uh, to take any advantage uh, from the loan that, uh, that he or she uh, extends to the person in need. And therefore, no interest on, or fees are to be charged on the loan, right? The creditor is only entitled to the return of the capital of the capital sum that uh, that uh, that he or she has lent out. Plus, uh, the creditor is also encouraged to give respite, to give time 
to extend the uh, the uh, the period of the loan for uh, for the debtor if uh, if he or she is hard pressed. So so that is a first a principle. So a, a, a money a money three three a monetary loan is uh, is never considered a commercial or business deal. It is always seen as a charitable act. Secondly, a, a, a debt, uh, whether a money a monetary loan or a commercial obligation, is to be repaid and honored. So so that so that is a flip side of the coin. So. Uh, so, uh, so the creditor is encouraged to be kind in demanding payment, uh, to be polite, and to give respite if needed by the debtor. And then, the debtor, on the other hand, is encouraged to be proactive in the repayment of the debt or the honoring of the commercial obligation when he or she has the means to do so or as contracted without the creditor having to chase after him or her. So here, so here, uh, so, so when it comes to both straightforward financial loans or a commercial obligation, no interest, no usury, and no unfair fees or charges are to be imposed by one party on the other, right? Because uh, usually also applies to commercial debt, right? To, uh, to, uh, to, to all uh, unfair and unwarranted charges that are often imposed by one party over the other. So that is also uh, considered a form of usury, any uh, unfair charges or unfair conditions in a contract in which the other party uh, is clearly uh, at a disadvantage. Okay, so that then okay, so so that is the the, the notion of debt in uh, in uh, economic terms. So whole uh, and whole idea of this is is uh, of of this ethics of debt is to ensure uh, is to ensure equity in transaction and also to and also to encourage uh, liberality or magnanimity in uh, in transaction or in uh, because transactions are important for people to earn their livelihoods and so it's important to ensure equity plus also uh, uh, to encourage uh, charity or big heartedness okay in more general societal terms uh, uh, conclude, Adia. Yeah, conclude. So, uh, so, so, uh, in uh, in more gen uh, in more general terms, everyone in a healthy com uh, community is formally or informally duty bound to one another. They are mutually indebted to one another, each owing the other a debt of service or favor. And this mutual obligation to one another is constantly uh, is constantly honored through each proactively uh, sufficing the needs of the community. So, uh, so, uh, so, so to conclude, uh, to conclude a, uh, the, the Islamic notion of that uh, is to, uh, uh, is, uh, is so that no one uh, uh, in a transaction, formal or informal, uh, is allowed to take advantage of, 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 of any indebted party. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. Thank you very much uh, for your inspiring conversation reflections. Thank you. We now move to uh, another uh, thematic area, which is about racial inequality. And for that, we are inviting our colleague from the World Council of Churches, Masiwa Rajigunda who is the program executive for racial justice and he himself is from Zimbabwe. Uh, Masiwa, you have the word, the floor is yours.
You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. I have that. I'm not sure if you're seeing my screen. Thank you. Um, so I will speak uh, briefly on racial uh, inequality and possibly to highlight um, a few perspectives for our consideration as we fight against the inequality in this world. Now, uh, racial inequality basically refers to the disparities in the manner in which persons access services, opportunities, power, and resources. Uh, and these disparities are actually based upon one's racial identity and not any specific uh, look at competence or other considerations. Just um, your racial identity is used, being white, uh, Black, Asian, Caucasian, Arab, Luo, uh, Shona like myself, um, these are the kinds of things that then are considered um, with respect to your access to services, to opportunities, and to resources. And we've already heard from previous speakers how uh, racial identity has actually influenced, for example, the distribution of vaccines. So does your identity make it easy for you to access resources like bank loans, mortgages, uh, mining claims in different areas, or does this identity make it difficult or even impossible for you to access these um, resources? So we have different uh, uh, experiences and, and all of us in this platform today uh, would possibly share our own experiences of how our identity, our racial identity, cultural identity has made life easy or more difficult. Um, do you think sometimes that your professional competence or qualifications are only considered only if a person from a different racial group is not found? Because that's also how racial inequalities manifest themselves that in some instances, your racial identity is much more powerful than your professional competence when people are looking for somebody to hire. Racial inequality simply means persons are treated unequally if they do not share the same racial identity. And the basis of that treatment is primarily racial identity. So it's not about professional competence, it's only about racial identity. Now, as people of faith, we believe we are all unique in our own ways. We are different or diverse in various ways. We can all see our differences. I look at you I see the differences between you and me. You look at me, you see our differences. But this diversity is not a problem. It is a God-given diversity. It makes us beautify the universe. There is no problem with diversity. From ancient times, diversity has always been part of the human story. The problem was not and is not that some people were or are seeing diversity in the community and community of faith. So seeing that we are different is not the problem. And I want to emphasize this particular point because it helps us to understand and to appreciate where we need to focus our attention on. The attention in fighting inequality is not that some people are seeing that we are different. The problem was and is that diversity was or is being used to exclude, reject, discriminate, and stereotype other people to their disadvantage. This is where the problem is. So the problem is not that we are different. The problem is that some people are using Hello. our differences 
Some people are using our differences to disadvantage others. Our world is replete with this problem. Diversity or difference in race, in culture, is being used to sanitize inequality, prejudice, inequity, and discrimination. Our diversity does not create racial inequality. Our diversity is being used by some to create racial inequality. Sadly, there are believers who do not see Christian faith or Islamic faith or any other faith for that matter as a non-discriminatory faith. They assume that their faith respects or sanitizes or coexists even, or has no problems with existing prejudices, including racial inequality. So in the 1960s and in the 1970s, when the World Council of Churches came up with a program to combat uh, racism, it was because some people of faith had developed a theology that sustains racial inequality. So what is the Christian perspective? Now, as Christians, we believe that God created the one human race with some differences or diversities, but equal in dignity, in responsibility, and with equal access to resources. And we can develop this understanding from Genesis chapters, uh, chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. We are created as one human race, equal in dignity, equal in responsibility, and with equal access to resources. Even though racial equality is God's plan, we are descendants of a human history dominated by a legacy and effects of racial inequality. The mighty Egyptians of ancient times saw themselves as superior to other races. So did the ancient Assyrians, Babylonians, and even some of the Hebrews Israelites. The empires of the past and present are all built on a belief of superiority, uh, inferiority complex. Masiwa, can you conclude, please? Yes, thank you. The prophets spoke against racial inequality, Amos chapter 9, verse 7. The Apostle Paul speaks against racial profiling of people are in Galatians 3, verse 28. Racial inequality is a symptom of deep-seated sinful ideas that falsely assume that differences between persons presuppose a qualitative difference that makes some people superior and others inferior. To be a Christian entails not simply being a non-racist, it demands being anti-racist. It is not enough to frown upon racism. We ought to act against racism because racial inequality is symptomatic of a festering disease. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masiwa. Thank you so much for this deep reflection and provoking us to think about our practices of faith and, and racism uh, inequalities. Now we move to the last speaker at the panel. We move to Athena Peralta, who is the Program of Executive for Economic and Ecological Justice of the World Council of Churches. Athena will speak about wealth and poverty. Uh, Athena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Aline. Uh, my first part, um, the first part of my presentation will share some reflections on wealth and poverty, uh, specifically from the Green Line Study Group um, that was convened by the World Council of Churches a few years after the global financial crisis. And in the second part of my presentation, I will briefly share about an ecumenical campaign to tackle inequality through tax justice. Wealth and poverty are two sides of the same coin. In order to address poverty, in order to also address ecological 
uh, degradation and the massive um, inequalities that we see today, the reverse side, wealth, particularly excessive wealth, has to be dealt with. And wealth um, has to be addressed alongside poverty for several reasons. And I quote here um, uh, Michael Taylor, uh, they have common causes and integrally related characteristics. The ability of the rich to earn a living, for example, is the inability of the poor. The strength of the rich is the weakness of the poor. Worse still, excessive wealth in itself is a cause of poverty. The drive to create a rising tide of wealth and become rich does not benefit rich and poor alike. It does not bring an end to poverty, but often exacerbates it. And by concentrating only on poverty, attention is deflected from the rich. At most, they are seen as the possible source of a solution to poverty, and they are not seen as a major part of the problem." End of quote. Now, from a Christian perspective, there is really an abundance of biblical teachings on wealth that are founded mainly on the conviction uh, that God is the creator who lovingly provides for all living beings what they need in order to live, not just live, but to live fully. So we see this um, from the story of, um, uh, of manna in the desert um, uh, uh, and also um, uh, uh, many other um, uh, uh, verses, which I think I will not um, uh, go into here. But basically, wealth is considered a blessing from God, not necessarily um, the result of exceptional success um, um, of human work. Wealth is to be used for the benefit of the whole community, but especially for those who are not able uh, to um, provide them um, for their own needs. Now, obviously not all wealth is to be rebuked. Um, wealth can be celebrated as a symbol of, of the good life. Uh, of course, bearing in mind um, uh, that, in, that in biblical uh, times, wealth was um, defined more in terms of family, in terms of um, animals um, rather than capital. So the question then is, um, uh, uh, when does wealth um, uh, become, for instance, uh, greed? Um, and we've talked about um, when the objective of maximizing returns becomes an end unto itself, when the social and ecological consequences of accumulating wealth um, are being disregarded, um, and when wealth provocatively demonstrates excessive inequality, which then undermines social cohesion and respect um, for human dignity. So in the interest of time, I will just um, uh, go directly now um, uh, to, to um, what then are some of the proposals um, uh, that we have uh, to counter uh, inequality. And I would like to introduce some um, uh, an ecumenical uh, campaign, um, of which um, the World Council of Churches is part of, but also the World Communion of Reformed Churches, the Lutheran World Federation, uh, the Council for World Mission and the World Methodist Council. And this is the Zacchaeus tax campaign, uh, which of course finds inspiration in the biblical character of Zacchaeus. Um, and the story of Zacchaeus is that when he encounters, Zacchaeus is a tax collector who encounters Jesus and this engenders a transformation uh, so that um, Zacchaeus is moved to give away half of his possessions to the poor and four times as much to anyone he has cheated. And this is the call of the Zacchaeus tax campaign, a repentance for wealth in the midst of poverty, a redistribution of wealth in the midst of a scandalous world and reparations for those who have been robbed. Uh, so quickly, the ZAC tax calls, for instance, for the enactment of progressive wealth taxes at global and national levels to curb the growing concentration of wealth. It calls for a stop to tax evasion and avoidance by multinational corporations and affluent individuals. It calls for progressive carbon and pollution taxes at different levels to protect our only planetary home. Um, it calls for the implementation of a financial transaction tax. Uh, to curb harmful speculative activities, 
It also calls for a COVID-19 surcharge on the super wealthy, on equity and hedge funds, on multinational and digital corporations um, that are reaping even greater returns from the current crisis to resource the critical response to the pandemic. Um, and, and I guess I'm, in the interest of time, I will, I will end here. Thank you so much, Athena. Thank you very much for keeping also the time. Very excellent. And for bringing us excellent reflections and deep theological conversations, uh, ecumenical conversations to address and overcome inequalities. I would like to open again to see if Father Florence, Florence is in the room. I have had some feedback that Father Florence from Tanzania, he is around. If we can hear you, Father, uh, we can have two minutes now from your side. No, I think we cannot hear. So um, technology is sometimes also not equally distributed in terms of access and and the uh, capacity to, to, uh, to be able to open it when, when we need it, when we really need the words and the reflections coming from Father Florence from the Anglican Church in Tanzania. We are keeping uh, this reflection maybe in another way, another access uh, later on. Um, we are very thankful for all the panelists that have shared your experience you have brought us with deep theological insights, thoughts. You have provoked us to continue our reflection from a Christian and Muslim perspective, from an interfaith practice, which is very much necessary to not only to talk about, as we normally say when we discuss inequality in terms of gender, Sometimes faith, faith communities, churches, um, theologians, theological thoughts can are part of the problem, are part of the uh, building of inequality. But here we have seen that faith from a different perspective are part of solution. We want to be part of uh, initiatives, ecumenical interfaith perspectives that are addressing and overcoming, transforming the different types of inequalities. And uh, in, on behalf of the organizers of the webinar, the World Council of Churches, ACT Alliance, the Lutheran World Federation, Christian Aid, Norwegian Church Aid, I would like to thank each one of you for your time, your contribution. I would like to finish this time, this webinar, with a word of prayer coming from a book that was organized by Christian Aid for its uh, 75th anniversary, uh, 75 Prayers for a Better World. It, it was launched uh, uh, some months ago. Uh, word of prayer for God of justice, we ask you, grant us your compassion. Make us whole so that we might open our eyes to the reality around us, to see the injustices, to notice the brokenness of the world. And while seeing, let us not accommodate, but open also our heart to be filled with compassion so we can open our arms and stretch our hands to help. Receive our claims of rage and hope in your journey of resistance to the unjust power that divide, destroy, and oppress. When individualism rules over collective care for people, suffering, inspire us to reclaim rage as a holy power, moving us not in bitterness, but in care and compassion 
as seeds of love and reconciliation. Bless us and gather us under your long and warm wings. Circle us with your loving arms when we feed alone, when we feel alone and in exile of relationships that are nurturing our collective actions. Amen. Thank you for your presence, your participation, and we continue our reflections uh, as we move in this festival. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. So much, everyone. This was really, really interesting.